and team leader, he was compared to Bill Russell. As an inside scorer, he rivaled Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And as a passer, he stood alone among centers. Bill Walton possessed all of the pieces of greatness, except one. Due to inadequate bone structure in his feet, he spent more than half of his NBA career on the sidelines. But beyond the frustrations of his injuries, he projected a social awareness rare to his profession. Here is Bill Walton, basketball player and political activist in that order. The country was in a great deal of turmoil. The Vietnam protest at their absolute height, uh, American boys being killed. The whole fabric of America was unraveling. Sports America didn't like the exterior society, which was changing at a rapid rate. This gifted athlete comes in, but he has attitudes that are unconventional and even seemingly radical. His hair was long, he was hippie, it was known that he smoked the weed. Is he smoking pot or is he a communist or, or what's going on? It was his way of making a statement. I always told Bill that what he represented to me was a rebel with a cause. I grew up in an environment where I was encouraged by my parents and by my coaches to, to question authority, to think for myself, and to have an opinion. Thinking people can only be turned against the present government and its agencies. Born to play basketball and educated to raise political hell, rarely had a man more closely fit his time than Bill Walton. As big man on the UCLA campus, the 6'11 center was impossible to ignore. Bill Walton was out front. Burn it down, shut it down. Those were his words. He wanted to do something important and be influential through basketball. He was a person that people looked to. Your voice is going to be heard more than our voice is. So he let it be known where he stood. With UCLA in the midst of a record run of seven consecutive national championships, Walton was often torn between his loyalty to a coach and a need to demonstrate where he stood in a nation divided. He was a champion of all minority causes. But when you're representing a team and a university, there are times when, you know, there's some things you probably shouldn't do. During the, the Kent State situation, he was out there riding with everybody else, and the coach just looked and shake his head. <laughs> I think he was led by other people on doing some things that I would rather he'd not been involved in, but he has a right to do it. Here was an older guy, a great coach, a young, great player. He wanted to win and Wooden wanted to win. And that may have been the only thing they had in common. Toward that end, Wooden imposed his rules with a predictable regularity. There's a plane ride. The stewardess comes by and offers Bill, and what do you want? He says, a glass of wine. And a moment later, she comes back with a glass of ginger ale, and she says, what's that? I said, the gentleman in that other seat said I was to give you this, and that's John Wooden. One of the saddest days for Coach Wooden had to have been the day he came down and had to bail me out of jail after I got arrested in the anti-Vietnam War protests. And I said, Bill, I know you feel very strongly about this, but I just don't think that you're getting arrested and taking part in these demonstrations is what it's all about. I think you should write letters. And I scripted this letter to President Nixon. And I requested that he resign. Coach Wooden, he was so mad. But he looked up at me with those sad, soft eyes. He said, Bill, I can't sign this. And you're not going to send this in, are you? And I said, yeah, coach, I'm sending this in. Well, I sent it in, and sure enough, Nixon resigned. It was unbelievable. Wooden was right, as always. After leading UCLA to two national championships, the three-time Player of the Year joined the Portland Trailblazers in 1974 and marched on the NBA in full revolutionary regalia. He was very pained about conditions, about the war. And he's one of the few people that had that type of visibility that put his prestige out there. If you're not 
part of the fight. That's a selfishness that is not acceptable. He would do his own thing, and people just didn't want to hear that. They called him a rebel. So you don't think there's anything contradictory about being a basketball player and, say, a social critic? I'm just a person who happens to play basketball. Walton's high ranking among the 60s leading radicals was enhanced by a close friendship with activist and writer Jack Scott. He and Bill kind of connected on some of their thoughts about how athletes were being used and abused. He was very instrumental in my life and in my progress as a human being. And, you know, Jack Scott was in, in, involved in all the battles of the day. Whenever I was out there, they was always close. I, at, at one time, they were living together. Family, commune, and all that. Bill Walton had called and wanted me to come to a party. I've never seen a place, one little living room in Portland, Oregon, where so many 60s radicals of some degree of fame attended. And Walton was right there in the middle of it. In 1975, Walton's roommate, Jack Scott, made national headlines when the FBI suspected him of harboring fugitive Patty Hearst, who, as an avowed member of the Symbionese Liberation Army, was wanted on bank robbery charges. Bill Walton stood by him to the extent that it cast a shadow on his career. By that, I mean when he sat down to do an interview, one of the first things would come up with Jack Scott. Have you ever had any dealings at all with Patty Hearst? Have you helped her in any way? No, not at all. What about Jack Scott? Have you helped him? Jack and I are real close friends. A lot, yeah, as well as his, you know, his beautiful wife, Mickey. You had a star player who was having his phone tap for the FBI. It was nervous for a lot of these people. I was having a staff meeting, and the Channel 8 people came breaking into the meeting to take pictures of me. The FBI got Jack Scott's father mixed up with Bill's father. That it was Bill's father that was asked to transport Patty Hearst. They didn't know who Patty Hearst was. I had never met Patty Hearst. And I have no idea uh, what she even looks like. I was dragged in on the periphery of that event. And, you know, in retrospect, it was a disaster for all people involved. Walton, and all through all this, was just somebody who supported these causes. I think he sort of grooved on being a part of it. Walton had ample time to pursue his counterculture activities. In his first two seasons, injuries kept him out of 78 games, while the Blazers cruised along under 500. He brings in this baggage while violating a basic law of sport America, which is thou shalt not speak out unless thou is playing at a championship level. He seemed to have so many views, often counter to mainstream US kind of thinking. And so he thought, wait, what, what's this guy all about? Why doesn't he just play basketball, you know, and just shut up? Born in La Mesa, a middle-class suburb of San Diego, Bill Walton was the second of four children. His father, Ted, was a social worker, and Gloria, his mother, a librarian. Grew up in an unathletic household. It was all about books. It was all about music. They had a very traditional home, and religion was important. But it was mixed with social obligation, and this should be a better country. You know, my dad, very interested in social justice and change. You always had to have something fresh to talk about. I would get up crack of dawn every day. I would always beat my dad to that newspaper. The education was the big thing. And if they had time for sports, then spend as much time as they wanted, as long as they got their schoolwork done. My parents would always challenge us. They would initiate these discussions about what was going on in the world his opinions were being made, they would not accept that. They would always keep pushing it. Before he was born, he was never still in it. <laughs> he was jumping around. And then as soon as he was born, he was on the go all the time. And it sounded as if he was just trying to talk too fast. And then we realized that um, he did have uh, a hang-up on certain words. The stuttering problem that has plagued me throughout my life has, has limited me as a person.
person. I just retreated from it. I said, I'm not going to talk. His biggest fear was to get in front of somebody and then stutter and not to be able to really say what he wanted to say. He was gawky and too tall, and he doesn't feel comfortable in his body. He was definitely self-conscious. He always wanted to walk next to the building as you walk down the sidewalk, because if you're next to the building, you don't look quite as tall. Bill never wanted to be seven feet tall. He wanted to be 6'11", because 6'11 was tall, but seven feet was a freak, as he said. I was a very reserved young boy with a big nose and a horrible speech impediment, found safety, found sanctuary, found peace, freedom, and a way to express myself through basketball. Go on to the basketball court, and everything that doesn't work for him in the normal universe suddenly works for him. Bruce was the perfect older brother, and boy, did he used to just beat me up on a constant basis. I developed a, a greater sense of speed and quickness, because I knew I had to get away from him. Bruce would just take Bill inside and pound him, and he'd force the ball in the basket. We'd be in a backyard court. We had a, a thorn bush off to the side. So I'd fake one way and pull up for that jumper. He'd just bam, knock me right down into that thorn bush. Walton debuted auspiciously on Blessed Sacrament's elementary team. Fourth grade, he was playing with sixth graders. I put him in, I told him, enough, look, just pass the ball, don't shoot. Next thing you know, he's, he's making a pass, but the ball goes in. <laughs> I, I knew you were going to be good, but you're making it look so easy. One of the first championship games I ever played in, I was very nervous. Didn't know really what to do in the pregame moments. I'm pacing back and forth in the restroom. Bill was just fidgety as can be. I said, come on, get with it. This is part of winning. And he said, hey, you've got to learn to love these moments, because that's what it's all about. And, that lesson there capsulized what the rest of my career came to, to mean to me. As a kid, I played basketball all the time. The competition, the sweating, the, the contact, the yelling at the referees. Basketball, for me, was the celebration of life. We'd go from the breakfast table to go out playing all day long, literally, until we dropped. That, that was really our whole life, just growing up as kids. We'd go over to the elementary school that had the eight-foot baskets, and we would think that, that we were the NBA guys, and so we would be throwing it down. He'd play by himself, and then three of us would try to pass around and get the ball inside, or he'd be in there blocking the shot before we could even get in. At Helix High, Walton's primary competition came from a crosstown rival and childhood friend, Elias Delgadillo. It was a kind of a wake-up call I would give Bill. you got to beat Elias. It was a challenge for Bill, and he rose to meet it. I would recall those long arms, the spider arms, into the jaw, into the chest, uh, asking for the ball. As a sophomore, I believe he was 6'2", at the start of the season, by the time he finished his junior year, he was 6'9". I cajoled a key to the high school gym, and then the, and the NBA came to San Diego with the San Diego Rockets. And, and then they found out that I had the key to the gym. We'd have uh, Pat Riley and Elvin Hayes, and Bill was competing with them, and he was in high school, and he was blocking guys' shots. They were pro players. Our coach would have a tennis racket, and with a tennis racket, he would extend it all the way up. And so with that, I would have to learn how to shoot and art the ball higher. You couldn't shoot over him. We went 66 and 0, I think it was, our junior and senior year. Obviously, we, we were killing people by, you know, 40, 50, 60 points in a whack. Ball goes up, Bill goes up. Helix players split. Bill spins in midair, fires the ball down court. It was like seeing a uh, college team with a fast break offense. Despite his dominance, Walton remained rail thin through high school but he had first-rate protection. Bruce was Bill's protector. If you fouled Bill, Bruce was going to very proudly pick up a personal foul, and the other guy was going to be eating a little plywood. There was a game when we were playing uh, against a team that was particularly intent on roughing me up. This guy cut him in half. And Bill shoots, makes the basket, shoots the free throws, makes the free throw. We're coming back the other way. They were running down the court, 
side by side. <laughs> Bruce gives the poor kid an elbow in the chest. All of a sudden, there was a big gasp from the crowd. And there was Bruce standing there over the top of this fallen opponent. And Bruce had the, the most sheepish grin on his face. I never saw that guy the rest of the game. Despite Walton's 29 points and 25 rebounds a game in a 33-0 senior season, Sports Illustrated selected Tom McMillan of Pennsylvania as high school player of the year. We just smiled at that. We thought, I wonder if they really know what's happening out here. After they ran that story, Sports Illustrated called and they said, who's this Walton kid? We've been told that he's the best player in the country, that we got the wrong best player. And nobody in the nation caught on. John Wooden caught on. San Diego had never even had a Division I player. And I told Coach Wooden, I said, he's the best high school player I've ever seen. He goes, shuts the door to the hall, and he says, Denny, don't ever make a statement like that. And we get to San Diego, go to the game. I said, well, what'd you think of him? He says, well, he is pretty good, isn't he? And that was an accolade for Coach. When Coach Wooden actually started calling and coming around, that, that was a dream come true. Because from the first time I ever saw UCLA play basketball, I knew that's what I wanted to do. It was a wonderful world for him. He got everything he wanted. One side of his life was the free spirit, and then the other side, the basketball side, was completely disciplined with great players and a great coach. Coach Wooden, outside of my mom and dad, has been the single most inspirational and influential person in my life. He spent his whole time dreaming about what would work for us as individuals. When Bill Walton joined John Wooden in 1970, the standards had never been higher. UCLA had won four consecutive national championships. Pauley Pavilion was Yankee Stadium. UCLA were the Yankees. You're playing with the best players in America. You have the best coach of all time. The weather's great, and at least half the fans are of the female persuasion. It's a great lifestyle. Polly Pavilion just glowed. We walk out on that court as the chosen few, people just jumping up and down and screaming. The band was playing, and the cheerleaders kicking their legs in the air and throwing the pom-poms up. And it was just such an unbelievable moment of celebration. In a brilliant college career, never was Walton's talent at a higher point than in the 1973 championship game against Memphis State. Bill Walton has now made, and get this, 21 out of 22 field goal attempts tonight. Walton finished with a finals record 44 points as the Bruins took their seventh straight title. As a college player, he was incomparable. He had a presence on the court that was so intimidating and engulfing that this cloud hung over the gym wherever he was. I was not a fun person to be around before the games, during the games, because I had to win. And, and I would work myself into a rage, into a terror. We used to do a, a drill in the hallway outside of the locker room where we would just pass the ball back and forth, you know, one hand, two hand, both hands, as quickly as we could. In my, my fingers would be beat red. He was burning the ball in so hard. And Bill would get so up before a game. But he'd have a hard time coming down. And he finally went to Wooden and asked for permission to smoke some dope, because it helped bring him down. And finally, Wooden said, yes, but don't tell your teammates. Bill Walton changed everything inside. I would love for people to get by me. I could put so much pressure on people that they would get by me and they would run into Bill Walton. And then as soon as that ball's visible, zoop, then he could just leap right off of that position without having to gather to come up. He had the ability to time his leap so that he caught the rebound and turned his upper body, had the uh, facility to throw that great outlet pass. He was a control tower through whom you ran both your offense and your defense. There's never been anybody quite like him. But the tower, known as Bill Walton, was already experiencing severe structural stress. He would spend 
at least 20 to 30 minutes with heating pads underneath his knees and on top of his knees and so that his, his knees would be just crimson when, when he got ready to suit up for practice. After every game, he would sit with ice for 20, 30, 40 minutes every day. He was a great athlete, body, quickness, eyesight, vision, coordination. He has all these great assets, and he has your grandmother's feet. Midway through Walton's senior season, UCLA's winning streak had reached 88 games. January 19th, 1974 at Notre Dame, a 12-point lead and the ball with a couple minutes to go. Walton limping a bit, 70 to 61, Shoemate intercepts, he's got two more. It goes from 11 to 7 in about 10 seconds, now the crowd gets into it. And then that's when the defense picked up. You're gonna take the air out of it, oh, here's the steal. Dantley goes all the way. 70 to 65, pandemonium now. Crowd smelled it and momentum was going. 32, 31, that's Clay Dujon! Do you believe that for three minutes and 22 seconds that you could shut out UCLA and beat them 12-zip? If you look back, that's what we did. Notre Dame 71, UCLA 70 with six seconds left. Into Walton, he can't score. Kurgovich, Myers, Shumate, it's all over! Mr. Davis won the game! The longest winning streak in collegiate sports history has ended where it began three years ago. I'll tell you that, you know, we lost that game 17 years ago, 14 days and 27 hours. It's that big of a thing to them. Failed expectations. We should have done a lot more. That's the kind of defeat you absolutely never get over. Digger Phelps, he ruined my life that day. Exposed as merely human, even to themselves, the Bruins went on a binge, losing back-to-back -back games at Oregon State and Oregon. But even after the trauma of that lost weekend, further disappointment awaited at the Final Four. March 23rd, 1974, North Carolina State at Greensboro. 11-point lead down the stretch in regulation with the ball. Couldn't hold on. Seven-point lead in the second overtime. Couldn't get it done. North Carolina State has ended UCLA's national championship reign. For Bill Walton, uh, that loss is one that he'll be thinking about probably almost every week, if not every month of his life. He says, well, I guess I really don't know how to play basketball. I'm a total failure. I'm worthless. I'm totally worthless. Sat there for an hour and a half just repeating the same thing. If I had one thing to do over again, it would be the day we lost to North Carolina State in the semifinals of the NCAA tournament. That lesson of Coach Wooden is about not beating yourself. Failing to prepare is preparing to fail. I'd like to have that week back. The Walton era ended at 86 and four. He averaged 20 points and his 16 rebounds a game eclipsed Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's school record. When I left UCLA and joined the Portland Trailblazers as their number one draft pick, it was tough. He's college player of the year and just all world and he comes and because of injuries and so forth, there's just nothing works out. 17 games into my rookie season, came to practice one day and I couldn't run. And it felt like there was stabbing knives uh, being jabbed into my foot. And they told me there was nothing wrong with you, Walton. You're just a malingerer, you're a quitter. And, and I was stunned. It wasn't getting fixed. And so they were putting him out there because they thought he was a malingerer and that made the problem worse. My problems were undiagnosed stress fractures. These were cracks in the bones that developed from playing too much basketball. You could never point to one moment when it happened and people couldn't see it. The players wonder, what's going on with this guy? I think and some of them had the idea that maybe he didn't have the, didn't want to be there. The local media cited Walton's diet as the cause for his injuries. He had goat's milk and carrots, but he had paper bags of juices. The old told said, you gotta eat some meat, man. You're wasting away to nothing. Eat some real food. Things were so bad so often that I would call up the owner virtually every 48 hours and say, I don't want any part of this. I quit. And I'd hang up the phone, and then I would sit there, and I'd just 
toss and turn all night long. I said, what do you mean quit? You, you can't walk away and be like, this is what you love. Before the 76-77 the season, the, the patience was beginning to wear thin that Walton may, may not, despite his phenomenal college career, be the franchise player. That spring, the Blazers hired Jack Ramsey as head coach. Then they obtained Maurice Lucas in the ABA dispersal draft, giving Walton the enforcer he had missed since he played with his brother in high school. I guess he was more impressed when I told him that I was going to protect him. <laughs> I'll take care of all that dirty work. He would go around Maurice Lucas literally and threaten people on our team that if they didn't play the game of their lives, he was going to kill them. Under the protection given him by Lucas, Walton emerged as the team leader. By midseason, the cloud of doubt that hovered over him for two years was replaced by Blazer mania. Everybody's watching and everybody's trying to look like him. What Bill is and what most of the culture of Oregon was at that time is a pretty natural fit. The local love-in peaked in game six of the 1977 finals against Philadelphia as the Walton Show drew a 96% TV share in the Portland area. And catching, using muscle, they go to the lob behind him on Walton, who threw the foul and hit the field goal. Bobby Gross will look, it's Walton he wants. Walton comes up on Darrell Dockins and puts it in. So Walton knows he's in a shootout. Here's McGinnis, Lucas comes out, McGinnis for the tie, it's off, and he's back. The 1977 Portland Trailblazer championship team was the youngest team in the history of the NBA to ever win the championship, and it was all so magical. I remember Bill had a habit of reaching over and palming my head. I wanted to be part of Jack Ramsey's brainwaves, so I reached out and put my hand right on top of his head, uh, trying to just get a little bit more uh, right from the great coach. The city went crazy. And it was the biggest sporting event that ever happened to Oregon. It was like this miracle had happened in Portland. This sport that they didn't really understand had come there, and in a relatively short time, they were the champions. They would come by the house in the middle of the night, just yelling and screaming, go Blazers, go, and they would leave flowers on the front steps. I just want to make sure that the guy that took my bike, I, I started on my bike today sometime. <laughs> I want to make sure that guy brings it back to me. I mean, it's like it's the only bike I have. We were all healthy that following year and riding on in victory. We just started the season like nobody could beat us. A very few did as Portland built a 50 and 10 record through February. When stress fractures reappeared in Walton's feet, the Blazers won just eight of the remaining 22 games without their leader. Despite intense pain, Walton played in the first game of the playoffs, scoring 17 points in a loss against Seattle. He asked if he could go into the doctor's office the day before the second game of the series and have a shot just to see how it would feel. I went out there and after taking that shot, I uh, was able for the first time to, uh, to run it all and move. 15 minutes into that game, the bone split in half. It was like a about like a racehorse in the stretch who broke its leg or something. You just sort of just, you could see him hobbling. Wally Walker. Bill couldn't even jump that time. The pain-killing shots that I took in my foot was obviously a mistake. The biggest mistake, though, was that I did not have enough courage, enough conviction in my own personal character to be able to stand up and say no. It's about a young man not accepting entirely his own responsibility for decisions made in the rush and promise of victory. Well, it did demoralize the organization at the time because headline stories were that scenario. Medical staff against Pill Walton. Walton sued the team doctor over the treatment of his foot, claiming negligence. But there would be no compensation for the irreparable damage done to his relationship with the Blazers. There was just no trust, and there was no confidence, and there was no mutual respect. And 
I made the decision that I couldn't work under those conditions. Bill was angry. He was depressed. They'd taken away what must have seemed like his life. And the consequences, instead of being a championship, had all been negative. My decision to leave the Portland Trailblazers was the toughest decision I've ever had to make in my life because that was my team, and I loved those guys. But the breakdown in trust and what makes a team work had been so complete. After sitting out the 1979 season, Walton signed as a free agent with the San Diego Clippers. It was a marketing dream. It was perfect. Hometown boy comes back, you know, mom and dad are here. It's all wonderful. The warning sign was that the news conference where he was announced after all the media left, I'm talking to Bill and I said, what are you up to now? I got to go to the hospital and get some bone spurs removed from my ankle. Holy smokers, they didn't announce that one to the public. His foot and ankle were poor shock absorbers. And so when you're both jumping and coming down, there was a lot of shock going on his feet at that time. And I think that's why he kept breaking down. I went and saw every doctor. I took every imaginable treatment, and nothing worked. The more I tried, the more frustrating it got, the more confusing it got. It was a, a, a disastrous point in my life. I thought he was done because from every indication that I had, the ankle and the, the foot was just dust. It needed bailing wire to be held together. And how do you play basketball? When you're an athlete in a team game and you're injured, it's the worst feeling in the world because you have no life. And you're not part of the team, yet there's nothing really you can go do to, to satisfy yourself. It was like seeing a you know, somebody like carving the eyes out of the Mona Lisa or something. He was such a brilliant player. I felt for him. In search for a viable alternative to basketball, the former radical changed his image and enrolled in Stanford Law School. I just called him up and asked him, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> Who are you now? <laughs> He was voted the most valuable player in pro basketball, and he led the Portland Trailblazers to the world title. Beat Bill Walton! Famous lovers. Why are you selecting famous lovers, Bill? <laughs> trying to join that category. He said, hey, yeah, I just think if I change my approach, then maybe my health would change. The franchise would have thrived in San Diego if Bill had had 10 healthy seasons uh, down there. But without that, it was such a disappointment. It is, without question, the biggest failure of my professional life because of the fact that the injuries kept coming back. Professional basketball failed in San Diego, and a lot of lives were hurt, ruined because of that, and I take full and complete responsibility for that. By 1985, Walton's ailing foot had been completely rebuilt through multiple surgeries. And after playing in 67 games for the lowly Clippers, Walton went in pursuit of a winning situation. I called up Red Auerbach and said, Red, I desperately want to be on your team. And Larry Bird was sitting across the desk from him. And Larry said, you go get that guy. He knew that he could help us with this limited amount of time that he would play. And he did exactly what we asked him to do. He realized that it was his last hurrah. And he also realized how fortunate he was to be the sixth man. So he was able to contribute without having his body break down. They used Walton as their comic foil, and he loved it. Bill was the butt of a lot of their jokes. I mean, Larry would make fun about Walton's feet and about his beard and his berry eating and his politics. After almost a decade out in the cold, Walton happily absorbed the hazing. In scrimmages, he led the bench against the starting team, usually battling with Kevin McHale. The practice sessions for the Boston Celtics were incredibly spiritual events. And the trash talking and the rivalry competition it was just incredible he'd always be like you know go green team you know and uh, we would just all laugh and you know, say, man, we're gonna kill the green team today occasionally I would stumble into a 
unfortunate play where the ball would bounce my way and they would just uh, tease me unmercifully about, hey, you know, this guy, he, he used to be able to do something out there. And then he'd play well and we'd always, you know, we'd run on the court and we'd go, flashback. And go, Absolutely. <laughs> we'd always say, he thinks it's 1977 again, he's with Portland. Averaging eight points and seven rebounds in 19 minutes, Walton appeared in more than 70 games for the only time in his career. He won the NBA's Sixth Man Award, and the Celtics won the title. They were just blocked in the room screaming, Go Celtics! Go Celtics! NBA champs! It ended up being like a week-long party. I'd call him up, and he'd answer the phone. Headquarters World Champions at Boston Celtics, Bill Walton speaking, and I would just start laughing. For me to be revitalized, to have that chance once again that I had lost so many years before, that's what made it so special for me. Sports Century, Bill Walton faces a new life after basketball becomes unbearable. He said, I've been living in pain 24 hours a day for the last so many months. And he said, I just had to make up my mind. This is the end of it. I have this image of an ankle and foot that has been just pulverized over time. There's a lot of sad moments in an athlete's life. One of the saddest for me was in 1987. We were playing in a big playoff game in Boston, and the crowd at the Garden but just chanting my name, Walton, 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 full volume. And I wanted so desperately to get out there and help the team and do what I could. And, and I couldn't go. A dispirited Walton stayed on the sidelines for the next two years. Then, as he trained for one last comeback attempt in February of 1990, the last fissures of a broken career opened wide. I was in the weight room at my house. As uh, I finished my workout, and was on my way back from the weight room to the house. I couldn't take another step. And the pain was just too great. And I, li I literally had to get down on my knees and, and crawl into the house. And I called my friend and I said, uh, I need some help, I need my crutches, I can't walk. finally came to the conclusion that basketball is done. Now, what do I do to live the rest of my life? And that was to fuse the ankle and the foot. He had bone against bone. There was no more cartilage left in his ankle. He either lives with it the way it is, or he has the ankle fused, so it doesn't move anymore. And if there's no motion, then there's no pain. My life is over. You know, I, I've got nothing. I can't, I'm never going to be able to run again. I'm never going to be able to yell at the rest. And, you know, basketball has been it for me. He says, what am I going to do with my life? What am I going to do with my life? And he looks at me and says, well, I'm a seven foot tall redhead with a big nose and has a stuttering problem. I think I'll go into NBA broadcasting, right? <laughs> my decision to go into broadcasting was one of the biggest stretches in recorded history. I have been cursed my entire life with a horrendous speech impediment. And when I was 28 years old, I ran into legendary Hall of Fame broadcaster Marty Glickman who took me aside and said, Bill, we've got to fix this stuttering problem. And I said, I, 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 I couldn't even talk. And I told him that uh, I used to stutter and stammer also when I was a kid and got over it through uh, application and some instruction. And uh, uh, he could get over it also. They worked together for some period of time. Bill flew back and forth, spent as much time as he could with the great Marty Glickman. Look what happened. The Trailblazers retired his jersey, and he launched into a 15 minute thanks to everybody, and my jaw is absolutely on my knees. And I looked, turned to my dad, and I said, Ted, where did that come from? I think he's making up for a lot of his years where he couldn't speak because he's talking all the time. <laughs> I miss basketball a lot, Dad. I miss the competition. What do you miss the most? Well, what I really miss the most is, you know, is waking up every morning and knowing that in just a couple hours I'm going to go out and kick somebody's ass on the basketball court. He's <laughs> one who has worked alongside Bill on broadcast. He just won't stop talking. The natural hand. 
Uh, as it turns out, who knew? Uh, it's an astonishing metamorphosis. I take my broadcasting career very seriously. I prepare, I work, I practice. It's just like being a player. When they throw that ball up, when that red light comes on, you've got to be ready. He'll go, for example, what he thinks the opening will be, and practice it for a half hour in the mirror of his hotel room until he finally sees himself, how he looks, how he says it, how he smiles. Bill kind of has a Cosell thing where you love him or you hate him, but you, you, you have to watch him. They played good defense in San Antonio. They rebounded well. The offense, that's what sucked for, for New York. He does kind of enjoy it when uh, the critics in the audience have their neck snapped by some comment that he's made. I'm sure he'd give it up in a second if he could you know, run and jump again. I think he's the most significant basketball player who's ever laced up with sneakers. Bill Walton influenced the game at both ends of the floor at a higher degree than any player who's ever lived. If you would take all the fundamentals you would want in a center, I think Bill Walton, healthy, would rate higher than any player that's ever played. It was love of game and a sense of purity that carried him almost in spite of the enormous vulnerabilities of that body. I don't think anyone could match Bill Walton when he was at his peak. The only problem was he wasn't there long enough. The contradiction is, in his personal life, he was the explorer and the counterculture guy. And in his basketball life, he was the ultimate orthodox person. He's had a lot more highs and a lot more lows than the normal person would ever experience. And to still be leading a charmed life is pretty remarkable. He doesn't walk on water, but he knows where all the stones are right below the surface. In the political world beyond the microphone, Walton remains abrasively candid. He actively backed former Knicks star Bill Bradley at his ill-fated bid for the 2000 presidential nomination. At a Democratic caucus in Iowa, Walton handed Vice President Al Gore a note that read, thank you in advance for withdrawing from the race. For ESPN Classics Sports Century, I'm Chris Fowler.